Thank you, Monroe. Good morning again to everybody. You are here, right? Good morning. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Uh, Mark wanted me to mention again, he brought out in Bible class this morning in the auditorium that uh, two weeks from today we'll, re we'll begin Sunday evening gatherings again, worshiping God. We're going to do things differently. It's going to be a shorter kind of a gathering and service. We're going to begin with several weeks of uh, videos as our main focus, kind of more like a Bible class kind of setting, and uh, going to be dealing with uh, how we got the Bible. Can we have confidence in the Bible as being truly God's word? And then looking at that from a scriptural standpoint and also from the evidences that are out there. Probably a lot of us have never really studied that particular line of, of thought and study. And so it can be very helpful to us. I know it has been for me in my past years gone by. And so we want to remember or we want to take advantage of that and, and shore up our faith along those lines. That when we're reading the scriptures, we're reading God's very word. And the scriptures repeatedly identify themselves as being God's very word. So we'll look at that. And uh, again, uh, a brother named Denny Petrio, who is known for his scholarship throughout uh, the brotherhood, basically, and he uh, works with the Bear Valley School of Biblical Studies in Denver. We'll be bringing those lessons on, in, in video format. So look forward to that. Again, two weeks from this evening, we'll start that again. Six o'clock, we're going to have a shorter service uh, because uh, we're going to be focusing on that. And so uh, hope everybody can be there. We have been looking at the subject of faith for quite a number of weeks now. This is actually the ninth lesson in this series, and it's actually the tenth uh, Sunday morning presentation along this theme, because in one of those lessons, I broke it into two parts to try to give it more focus in each one of those parts. Last Sunday, we asked the question, how can I stay faithful? And I've talked about in teaching over many years that sometimes when we're trying to emphasize a particular understanding and point, looking at it from a straightforward point of view and perspective, we can get that across, but sometimes if we look at it in kind of reverse order, oh, it seems to make a whole lot more sense very quickly, we get the message all of a sudden. Well, when we're talking about faithfulness and continued faithfulness, we understand that as we've been bringing out repeatedly throughout this series, that our faithfulness, our faith in God, our faith in Christ, and that belief put into action through our faithfulness, that is our daily, uh, our daily dedication to God and Christ through the teachings of the scriptures, and the scriptures being the faith upon which our faith develops, or from which our faith develops, and then as we live our faith actively, obediently, consistently, that's our faithfulness. And so continued faithfulness on our part, individually, personally, well, that's, that is definitely a condition central to which, upon which out we will receive the crown of life or an eternal home in heaven. Our faithfulness is crucial central to our ultimately being able to look forward to eternity with our Lord and Savior and God our Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. Well, Revelation 2 and verse 10, the last statement in that particular verse by our Lord and Savior himself said, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. We look also at, at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13, he who endures to the end will be saved. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the first couple of verses there. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required, required in stewards that one be found faithful. Now the idea, if you look at that word faithful in, in a literal uh, analysis, it means full of faith. And the idea there being 
We're living our faith. Our life is demonstrating our faith in the way that we live our lives on a daily basis. And it's a lifestyle of dedicated commitment to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or we could say to God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In James chapter 1 and verse 12, we <coughs> note that James wrote, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Now the idea of enduring temptation is you're facing it, but you're facing it and living through it based upon your faith in God and Christ, and that faith is seeing you through that challenge to your faith. You're staying faithful. You're not giving in to the temptation. You're not letting the devil have his way with you to lead you into sinfulness. And so blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life or eternal life in heaven, an eternal home in heaven, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The Apostle Paul described his life of faith exhibited in his faithfulness in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Very active lifestyle. That's what faithfulness is supposed to be. So he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, again, these are very straightforward instructions and teachings on faith and faithfulness, faithful living. But sometimes if we look at it in reverse order, it helps us to better analyze how to achieve a desired goal. Sometimes you may listen to an analysis of somebody or maybe a report of somebody. They talk about they picked up some particular piece of equipment that somebody else had manufactured and they take it apart and it's reverse engineering. They see how does it work and then they start analyzing why did that happen in that way, tracing it back from a reverse perspective all the way to the beginning. Reverse engineering. Well, sometimes if we look at reverse analysis when we're talking about the teachings of the scriptures or some other kind of analytical reasoning or, or teaching that we need to understand better, it helps us to understand from end to beginning Maybe help, that helps to kind of solidify in our minds what we have been taught and what we're kind of picking up as we looked at it from beginning to end. And so that's what we're going to do today. If we recognize what will lead us to unfaithfulness, to not be faithful, then we can better be equipped to guard against those dangers and live a life of faithfulness to God. Now, what's the quickest way to become unfaithful? What's the quickest way to become unfaithful? And I'm not talking about necessarily losing our faith or our belief in God and in Christ, but I'm talking about becoming unfaithful to them even though we still have faith in them. Remember, James said the demons believe. They have that much faith but they're still the demons and they're still under condemnation. So that we've, as we've labored over making the distinction between having faith or intellectual belief or even emotional belief in God and in Christ, there's a difference between that and putting that into action through faithfulness. And there's where obedience and consistent dedication and commitment on an ongoing consistent basis comes into play. So what is the quickest way for me or you to become, or anybody, to become unfaithful? Well, first, let's get right down to basics. Be sure if you want to become unfaithful, do not read your Bible. Do not get into God's Word. Don't try to increase your knowledge of God's word or his will communicated through the scriptures because the scriptures guide us in God's will. When Paul wrote to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, he said that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The scriptures guide us to salvation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God's very word and is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So since the word of God, the scriptures, the Bible, guide us in God's will for our lives, don't read the Bible. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, be diligent or study to show yourself, present yourself, approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Why does a worker for God not need to be ashamed? Because he can rightly divide or handle correctly, understand accurately and apply properly the word of truth. God's word. God's word, studying his word diligently, is key to standing approved before God. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 that God's word teaches us what to believe and why we believe it. And knowing God's word equips us to be better able to share those important truths with other people. In 1 first, first Peter chapter 3, verse 15, sanctify the word of the Lord God in your hearts. That is, you hold him close. You hold him close, and you, you hold him in a very dear, special place in your mindset, in your daily life, in your thinking. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. God's word is going to equip you to be able to do that, to know those teachings, those truths. And so don't get into God's word if you want to stay, if you want to be unfaithful. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, as we have emphasized repeatedly over and over and over again through this particular study, where does faith come from? How does it develop within the individual? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or faith comes by hearing the word of God. As we study God's word, we learn what we're supposed to believe, what God wants us to know in order to be with him in all of eternity. And we also learn how to be faithful, active in our faith consistently as we live our lives day in and day out. So, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul said, till I come, give attention to reading to exhortation, to doctrine, which is teaching. So, one of the quickest ways to become unfaithful, don't read your Bible. Don't get into God's word at all. Don't listen to anybody teaching the Bible, and you will almost naturally become unfaithful. Second, quickest way to become unfaithful, don't pray. Don't go to your heavenly father in prayer. Don't pray to him through Jesus Christ, your Lord. Don't pray. Prayer puts you in touch with and it puts you under the influence of God the Father. So in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, God says through the prophet there, Call to me and I will answer you and show you what great and mighty things which you do not know. That's been called God's telephone number, Jeremiah 333. Well, remember when there used to be prefixes to telephone numbers? You understand if, you're, if you remember back that far. Now there's just numbers, but it's still been called God's telephone number, Jeremiah 333. What does God say? Call to me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Well, you don't want to be in touch with God if you want to become unfaithful. Stay away from prayer to God. You can bring all of your needs to God and you, all of your concerns before him through prayer. What a marvelous blessing that God has bestowed upon us to be able to talk to him directly about any concerns, all of our needs, whatever might be in our mind, and even at times when we don't know what we really need to be praying about, but we know we need to be in touch with God. That's prayer. That's that tremendous blessing of prayer. In, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul spoke of God 
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We talk about needing power in our lives. We talk about needing solutions. We talk about needing resolutions. Whatever the need might be, God's all powerful. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, nothing is impossible for God. God has that power, all powerful, and we can tap into that power for whatever the need might be in our lives, strength, guidance, wisdom, whatever, through prayer. It's like a, it, it's like a, a direct line cord, power cord, plugged into the throne room in heaven, plugged into God's throne. That's prayer. How powerful prayer is and can be. In 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 14, John the Apostle wrote, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. Prayer. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is a tremendous blessing. James wrote about how we, how we can pray to God for wisdom in any given circumstance and in every day of our life as we look forward to whatever that day may confront us with. In James 1 and verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. We certainly all need wisdom every day and throughout every day and throughout our lives. Prayer is so important to faithfulness. So, don't pray. The Apostle Paul wrote in, in, second, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But unfaithfulness means I'm not living in the will of God consistently. I'm living by my own will. I'm neglecting his will. So what is the quickest way to unfaithfulness? Well, don't read your Bible. Stay out of God's word. Don't listen to anybody teaching the Bible. Don't pray. Don't pray. Don't pray. Cut yourself off from direct communication with God and you will almost certainly become unfaithful. Well, what about number three? Don't attend church services. Don't meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ to worship God and study his word at all. Don't do it every first day of the week. Don't do it on Wednesday nights for midweek Bible classes. Don't get together on other occasions with your fellow Christians. Stay away from those kinds of gatherings. Don't meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't come together with them to worship God. Don't come together with them to study his word. When we look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, the Hebrews writer, he encouraged, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. In other words, our hope in God through Jesus Christ of eternal life with them in heaven. Let us hold fast to that without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So how can I help my brother and sister in Christ? Be stronger in their faith. Be active, be effective in their faithfulness. And how can I gain from their faithful, their strength and faithfulness to help me become better faithful, more faithful, stronger in my faith? He goes on and says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and, all the, and, and, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, if I want to be strong in my faith, if I want to help my brothers and sisters in Christ stay strong in their faith, and if I want them to help me to become even stronger in my faith, I, I can be with them. I can be with them every time the church comes together to worship and study God's word. And so, quickest way to become unfaithful, don't be at any of those gatherings of the Lord's body, of the church. 
Don't come to worship God with, with the church. Don't come to Bible classes. Stay away from those kinds of assemblies. You can pray for wisdom, but if you're talking about, I really want to know God's will, stay away from that kind of prayer. That wisdom will be what we read in Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. Come together regularly, consistently with the church to worship God and study his word. The songs that we sing in worship are, are songs not just to sound pretty to our ears, but they're songs designed to praise God and teach and encourage all of those gathered together to worship God through the singing. When we look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, what does Paul say? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're praising God, we're worshiping him through the songs, but the words of the songs have meaning. They have actual instruction. Sometimes they're even prayers. And we're singing, as we're singing the words of those songs, we're singing to one another, each of us, all of us gathered together, singing those songs together. Colossians 3 and verse 16, same thing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now again, we're worshiping God through those songs, but the messages of those songs are messages teaching God's word. So stay away from that. Stay away from that if you want to become unfaithful. Stay away from that kind of gathering wherein that kind of positive, spiritual, godly influence is going to be imparted to you all through that time you're together with the church worshiping God. Consistently stay away from services. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 122 and verse 1? And I believe David wrote this particular psalm. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I believe the understanding behind his expression there was he was the first generation in his bloodline, his family lineology for a number of generations that now he was able to actually physically go to the tabernacle himself and worship God because of sin way back down the generations in, in his, his lineage, his family. He was glad to be able to go to the house of the Lord. Well, look at it rather as, as a burden to have to be with the church when they come to worship God. Stay away. Something that you don't want to have to do. So don't, don't be with the church. Don't come to worship services. Don't come to Bible classes or any other gathering of the church when God's word is being taught and he is being glorified through that gathering. Consistently stay away when the church gathers to worship God and you will pretty much be certain, be certain to become unfaithful. Let's look at one more. The fourth one. Let's be sure to not get involved in any work or activity of the church. Don't be active as a Christian. Don't take part in any of the activities or the good works that the church is striving to be a part of. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, often quoted verses of scripture. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. The very next verse, within still that immediate context, verse 10, goes on and says, For we are his workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, do not walk in them if you want to become unfaithful. Do not take part in any of those good works. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, speaking of Jesus who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. He died on that cross to pay that redemption price for our souls, for our eternal life. 
and purify for himself his own special people, that's the church, that's Christians, true Christians, zealous for good works. As Christians, we're supposed to be zealous for good works. In the third chapter, verse 8, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful, that is, full of care. In other words, really focused to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So since those things are so important to our faithfulness, stay away from them. Do not take part in any good works if you want to be unfaithful. James talks about what faith really is in terms of action. And so in James chapter 2 and verse 17, thus also faith by itself, all by itself, on its own, if it does not have works, is dead, he says. Now, once was not enough for him to write that down by God's guidance through inspiration. In verse 20, he goes on and says again, Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then again he goes in verse 22, he says, Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect or complete? And then that's not the end of it. In verse 26, he says again, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You see, James is trying to get across. Paul was trying to get across. Jesus was trying to get across. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. That works are the vital signs of true faith. Of effective faith. Involvement in good works and activities of the church will strengthen your faith. You will feel, you will be a part of the church through those good works. So, do not be involved, do not be involved in any of the good works associated with the church, any of the good works that God wants us to be involved in as members of the church, and then that will give you not being involved, not being active in those ways, that'll give you a much better chance to become unfaithful. Unfaithful. Don't, it, it, what, what you can do is just make excuses. Say, you know, I used to do that. I did that back then. I'm not going to be to do that anymore. Somebody else needs to be doing that. You mean you don't have the ability anymore to be involved in those ways? Or are you involved in some other good works? Just make excuses, find reasons to not be involved, and that'll help you become unfaithful. The quickest way to become unfaithful, the quickest way is to simply ignore your faith. Make excuses for not being at church services. Make excuses for maybe res feel resentment in your heart. Let it well up. Somebody else ought to be doing that whatever, for not being involved in good works. Don't pray to God. Stay out of your Bible. Consistently stay out of your Bible. Just ignore your faith. And that will be, be the, the quickest way to become unfaithful. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, Paul said, If then you were raised with Christ, and you were as you were baptized into him, you were buried with him in the waters of baptism as he was buried in that tomb. And as he was buried in that tomb, he went there to die on that cross, buried in that tomb to pay the price for the guilt of our sins. But he did not stay in that tomb. He arose from that grave, alive, risen. And when you were buried in those waters of baptism, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, you were baptized into his death, buried with him in those waters, in that symbolic spiritual way. And the blood that he shed on the cross cleansed you of the guilt of your sins at that point. But then just as he came forth alive from the tomb, from the grave, you came up from that watery grave, completely washed clean of your sins. 
Whatever they might have been, however horrible they might have been, however, however repetitive they might have been, the blood that he shed on the cross as you were buried with him in the waters of baptism cleansed you clean. You might have gone down with sins like crimson. The Old Testament prophet talks about you came up as white as snow spiritually. You were reborn, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. You were a new creation spiritually, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Don't focus on any of that. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things in the earth. What is your primary focus in life? Is it saving up in your 401k or your IRA for retirement and you want to have X number of dollars there so you can live the life of leisure or whatever you want to do? There's nothing wrong with that kind of preparation and planning, but is that the primary focus in your life? The primary focus in your life should be getting to heaven. First and foremost, above all. But don't focus on that. Your faith should be your life, as we read Paul talking about it, to become his life. And he's been an enemy of the church prior to becoming a Christian. But don't let it be the focus in your life. Not any aspect of it. Ignore your faith. Stay out of God's word. Don't pray. Stay away from church services, gatherings with the church of any kind. And don't get involved in any of the good works that God has designed for us to be involved in. Make excuses, whatever it might be. Just don't get involved in them. And I can just about guarantee you, hands down, without question, you will become unfaithful. Quickest way to become unfaithful, completely ignore your faith. Now, why such emphasis? Doing nothing to nurture, to strengthen your faith will lead you to become unfaithful. Why this really emphatic emphasis from this negative perspective to help us understand the positive perspective. I need, I need to be in God's word consistently, regularly. I need to be praying to God, being in touch with him through that marvelous blessing of prayer. I need to be under his guidance, under his influence. I need to submit my will to his will. I need to be obedient to him, and I need his guidance giving me wisdom to know how to do that. So I need to be in his word, and I also need to be with the church as the church gathers to worship him, study his word, to be together in Christian fellowship, because that strengthens me. I need that for my faith to be strong so that I will be truly faithful. And I need to be involved in the works and activities of the church because God wants me to be. And again, when I put myself into my faith and dedication in those active ways, that's just going to strengthen my faith. My faith needs to be my life. That needs to be my focus in life, primarily, first and foremost so that I can stay faithful and grow stronger in my faith and faithfulness all through my life. If you're not there, please do what needs to be done in your life. If you need to get back into God's word, do that. If you're not sure exactly how to go about that, please ask us. We'll help you. If you need prayer, please step forward and let us know so we can pray with you and for you. Or talk with us privately so we can pray with you and for you. If you need to get together and study, with, ask us. We, again, will make the way. If you're ready to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, please let us know this morning. Come forward. 
or talk to us right after services so we can help you take that step of obedience so that you can be baptized into Christ and you can become that new creation spiritually. If you need to, won't you come right now as we stand together and sing.